Well, good evening. Thank you for coming. Wow, look at the crowd. And let me point out that Star just touched that top booklet. <laughs> so now it's worth a million dollars. I'm touching this next one. Maybe 50 cents. <laughs> Sorry, just cut this one out. All right. Um, I think it's kind of a tradition to have about four poems in, in our books, and uh, this time I am going to read them all. All right, I'm going to start with, uh, I don't know, when you get, uh, wake, wake up in the morning and you just look out the bedroom window and nothing's happening, but then you, know, you just feel like there are things happening. They don't make much sense, so try not to look for sense, but they're happening. They might be happening. I don't know. All right. So, so this came out of one of those misguided moments. Uh, and it's a prose poem. Not that it matters to you who are sitting so far away, but it is a prose poem, you know, going from sad to sad. Okay. I don't know why that matters either. Some mornings when brief, waiting for the rain, one week before solstice, in the overcast waiting room of the valley, so vast, so inexplicably hooked into a filament eye, we banish the legend of a sun. The eye broods blue and white and gray. Somewhere in the neighborhood, a painter fixes the mistake of a cerulean sky, strips the sycamores, unzips a lover's cherry skin. Who bangs on the green tambourine? Who looms behind the clouds, the stars, the curtain? Blind fingers fumble for my hand in the linen maze, two heavenly bodies shanked in a red, red bed. This is no mistake. This is your only forecast, your single hook, my single eye, a drop of rain a drop of cherry wine, there, 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 and then rain, again. <laughs> um, I forgot about this next poem, and when we were looking for poems for this uh, booklet, then I was looking through my files and I thought, what's this? <laughs> I couldn't remember, but it had a very particular date uh, the 31st, uh, uh, yes, of December of last year, and I kind of remember some kind of a news item that people uh, burned in inside their bedrooms or some, I don't know, maybe I just made up much of it, but I thought of two people and uh, their lives, how it may have looked, you know, just just how people get burnt in their own beds, I don't, it, it's, it just started a, a story in my head, and uh, that's what this one is. But then again, it could be true. The title is What They Shared. AA for one thing, but also the hanging plans and the one way to water them in the sink and then let them drip semi-dry next to her nylons like sad sex. Therapy sessions when they cut too deep. The sweet smell of metal or dust. Mixed metaphors in their swollen tattoos, but not Paris. The kitchen where they made love and loaves of crooked bread with cinnamon and chives and cheddar, but the cinnamon was wrong, maybe from a page flipped by the blasting fan. And tomato scoop, soup. <clears throat> Let me read this again. And tomato soup, scalding like tempest, cruising on cantilevers, wings over very little water, they called the Russian foreplay. Time between meds, desperate bars of chocolate to tame deep shadows in their flaming twin mattress. Their full names flanking the column in this morning's paper. Um, another poem that comes from, well, this one does come from an actual event. I was um, going for a walk in the cemetery at the end of February when I thought, well, this, 
Winter should be over at the end of February, even in Logan, Utah. And look at what it did. Actually, there's snow in the forecast. I'm just making that up, sorry. <laughs> okay. okay, all right, bad joke. There is more of that. Okay, this one is called Sunday at the Cemetery. So much snow fell last night, deep enough to invite walkers into snaking grooves cut by cars that spill the living, enough to fell sycamore and box elder limbs, their long knotty fingers tilting toward the low-riding sun, their bruises breathing sour-smelling sap, enough for a family to heap two snowmen by a headstone on the children's lane, sycamore for arms, and some pink or orange coating to mark what I take for a snow girl from a distance. Then the dipping sun swallows all sounds and fast-moving shadows, and I stand there alone with snow people who have already lost their kumquat teeth, but not the orange bandana or the rainbow-striped knit scarf or a single ski leaning on snow boy or the crystallized traces of orange tang, maybe Kool-Aid, or the headstone. All this, all, sorry, all this is for a student's little sister, died doing what she loved, broken by deep white shadows we learn or not to master. Do we have time for one more? Yeah, okay, all right. Uh, because this is the fun one. <clears throat> think I. All right, so um, actually this, is, um, this, this poem came from somebody else's poem, but Billy Collins um, publicly gave us permission to just, you know, read other people's poems and then read our own, and if there is anything uh, common, it's fine. This is not exactly what he said, but basically that's, uh -huh. that's what it is that we are standing on other poems, poets' shoulders. So here's me standing on somebody else's shoulder. But the idea was to, to get some kind of a, um, an impossible gift for, for our birthday. And that's pretty much it. <laughs> gift. On my birthday, I wish for a koala. She arrives packaged in gold foil, unzips her pouch, and lets me pet her joey the size of a digit on my forefinger. Joey's whole body rippling suction on the invisible tit. My koala has issues. She falls asleep at dawn when I wake up, one last wig of eucalyptus tucking her teeth, a small smile parts her lips, oh, to be round with milk. That she sleeps through my birthday, I can forgive. When she wakes up tonight with a major eucalyptus breath, her ear tufts spread in amazement at my adventures at the grocery store. She likes my leek soup with a pinch of nutmeg, which pops little Joy's eyes wide open, turns syncopated sucking into rock and roll wiggle, and he strikes the Travolta pose in a snow white three piece suit, and she forgives, forgives me for that. It's getting late, I tell my koala. She says it is her turn for stories. Perches on my vacant pillow in my bed, her eyes a brilliant coal pool in the full moon. I say, I'll swap life with you, she barks. You can't be serious. Who would want your issues, your hair dye, your empty nest, your omnivore breath? So she tells me about her ancient great aunt and trappers and extinction. But I sink into deep sea sleep Yet, I distinctly remember my koala telling me, aren't you glad you got me for your birthday and not a rattlesnake? Thank you. <laughs>